Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this lecture in CS151 on algorithms. We're going to look at a couple of different kinds of algorithms. We're going to start off looking at search, um, which you've had some experience with through uh, the recursive functional programming lecture. And then we're going to move on to looking at sorting algorithms. And mostly we're going to use these as, as examples of how computer scientists think about algorithms and how they think about ranking which algorithms are best. All right, so let's start off by looking at search. Let's think about um, a straightforward approach to how you, might how you might search for an element in a list. So the problem set up is that we have a list of items and we want to return the position of the item or none if it's not in the list. And Python makes it easy to return things like none if we can't find um, the item. So one way you could solve this problem is just to iterate through the list using a for loop Super simple, keep track of the position that you're looking at at each iteration of the loop, and then when you find the item, you return that position. Or if you don't find the item, that means you get to the end of the list without finding the item, we just return none. <clears throat> All right, so here's an example I put together. Here is our list um, with items. This might look familiar for, again from the functional programming lecture. Here's L representing that list, and we're going to search for item 3. And I've written some code for us here in um, Python. It just starts off by setting position at 0, loops through the elements in the list. If it finds um, an element of the list that's equal to the item we're looking for, so if it finds an element of the list that's equal to 3, it breaks. So you saw this early on in one of the Zybooks readings. A break just takes you out of the loop uh, wherever it occurs, and stops executing the loop, the for loop or the while loop. If that item um, is not equal to the element we're looking at, then we're going to execute position plus equals one. So we add one to the position and keep on looping. All right, so the arrow points to our initial command, position equals zero, which puts us right here in our list. And then we simply execute the list, the, the, uh, the loop, going through just until we find the element. Once we find the element, we break, and we're finished. Let's look at a situation where we can't find the element. So we're looking now for item equals 10. There's no 10 in the list. And so we simply iterate through the whole list, one after the other, until we can't find the element. And then to return none, we would just check whether the position was equal to the length of the list. All right, that's super simple, but it's a great way for us to start looking at how computer scientists think about the speed of an algorithm. So how fast is this algorithm? And how fast is algorithm compared to other algorithms? Well, first of all, there are lots of ways that we can talk about um, how good algorithms are compared to each other. How much memory do they use? That is how many variables or how big of a list if they're storing data. How easy are they to understand? Do they always give the right answer, or just almost always? If they are wrong, how wrong are they? There's a bunch of other ways we can measure the desirability of algorithms. But for now, we're just going to think about speed. So how long does an algorithm take to solve the problem we're interested in? In other words, how much work does it have to do to solve the problem? All right, so let's take a look at our program we wrote. There are a lot of different things happening, even in a small piece of code like this. There's a for loop that is um, checking to see whether there are any more elements in the list. It's incrementing each time, moving us through the list. Um, we increment this position counter. Um, there's an if statement. So remember, this all gets turned into assembly language or machine language commands. And there's going to be dozens of them just even for a small loop like this. But which ones matter? So how, how do we measure which ones are actually doing work we care about? All of these things are doing work but we don't want to keep track of all the work that's being done. We want to abstract the, the, um, the loop. We want to think about what is it that's important. So imagine a situation where we just had the simplest case, right? We have a list of length one. That's like a base case we talked about earlier. What would we have to do to solve the problem of whether the element we're looking for is in a list of size one? Well, all we have to do is compare the element that's in the list, the single element, 
with what we have. So that tells us that's the fundamental task we're doing. We're comparing the elements in the list with the element we're looking for. All the for loop stuff and they're keeping track of the position, that's all part of taking that, that single operation, the comparison, and extending it to a longer list. And the number of times we extend, every time we extend that um, problem to a larger list with a for loop, we're adding more comparisons. So if we just keep track of the comparisons, how many they are, that'll tell us how much work is being done overall. All right, and this is, of course, specific to search. Other kinds of algorithms, you might have to come up with a different um, operation that you consider to be the fundamental operation that's really doing all the work. All right, so let's think about this. Here's our algorithm again. How many times we perform the comparison operation? Well, it's once for every element in the list. On average, an element that we're looking for, if it's in the list and it's placed randomly, so it could be in any one of these positions, on average, that element um, will be found after we searched half the list. So the mean value for zero through six is something like three and a half here. So there's seven elements. And so on average, we have to search three and a half positions to find the element we're looking for. If it was a million item list, we'd on average search 500,000 of those positions before we found the item. That's just an average for any particular search. The item might be the first item in the list or maybe the last item in the list. So the first statement we can make is that if the item is in the list and the list has n elements, then we expect to perform n over two comparisons. So we expect to search half the list before we find the item. That's called the average case analysis, and it is extremely useful, and um, people do it a lot. But it turns out that what people really care about is the worst case analysis. So the average case analysis tells you what usually happens. But if you're running a program and it has a particular case, maybe a search algorithm, that if it's given um, a particular order of values, it takes a very, very, very long time to search. You want to know that. You want to be able to say, what's the worst this algorithm can do? Because if you hit that worst case, you might be in trouble. Or maybe that worst case happens a lot more than you expected, and so your algorithm actually runs really slowly. So what people tend to look at, computer scientists tend to look at, is the worst case analysis. So the worst case for our linear search, where we just look at each item um, in order to look for the item we're, we're interested in, um, is n. So remember, if the item isn't in the list at all, we have to search all the elements to find that out. And so the worst case number of comparisons we have to perform is equal to the number of elements in the list, or n. So our worst case analysis depends on the size of the problem that's being looked at. When it comes to search, the size of the problem is determined by the length of the list that we have to search. So now we have an idea that we can talk about the speed of an algorithm as a function, um, a function of the size of the problem we're trying to solve. So in this case, the um, time it takes in the worst case to solve a search problem with a list of size n is n. And in mathematics, if you take um, a calculus course, you may well see this notation where um, we talk about um, omicron and theta and um, omega as defining how fast a function grows. So in this case, computer scientists care about functions that describe how fast does the running time or the number um, of comparisons or the amount of work that has to be done, how fast does that function grow in the worst case? Even though it's capital Omicron, everyone just calls it big O. And so computer scientists would say um, that, the sorting, that the search algorithm is looked at in its worst case is big O of N meaning that the program can solve every problem that can be given of size n in no more than n steps. 
Now, I, I want to point out that I'm being a little bit fast uh, and loose. This is a freshman course. Um, Big O has a very specific mathematical definition um, involving dropping constants, etc. But for our purposes, it's just an indication of how many operations um, are needed to solve a problem of size n. All right, let's look at another search algorithm. This is one we looked at um, in depth in the functional um, programming part of the course. So this is binary search written in a recursive manner. And remember that um, binary search cuts the amount of work that has to be performed in half at every step. And you can see here, this is where the division in half happens, where we just take the first part of the list or the last part of the list and then run recursively on that half of the list. And you can see at every step in this search, we of course also have a comparison happening. And we again can use this comparison operator as our measure of work. So it's important when we're looking at different algorithms that we use the same measure of work. Um, so we looked at the comparison operator. So does it, are they equal um, for our linear search? And we're going to use that same measure of work for our binary search. So we're comparing apples to apples. And you can see that we have one comparison check here, one equality check for every step in the algorithm where we divide the algorithm, we divide the uh, list in half each time until we get to just a list of size one, we perform one more comparison and then we're done. All right, so let's think for a second about um, exponentials and logarithms. Um, as I said, this is, this is a freshman course. You may not have had a lot of exposure to log and ex exponentiation, um, but it's gonna be important for our analysis of binary search. So when we double the size of something three times, we write two to the three equals eight, right? So you can see how it's happening here. We start with one element, two to the one, we get two of them, two to the two, we get four, two to the three, we get eight. Now, the inverse of this operation, or one of the possible inverses, is the logarithm function. So the logarithm function tells you how many um, times can I have a given number before I'm left with one, right? So exponentiation said, how big does it grow after some number of steps, some number of doublings? Logarithm says, how many, how many halves do you have to do before you get to one? All right, so if we're given eight and we um, ask the question, how many times can we divide it in two? Uh, we say log base two, because we're having, if this was dividing in three, we'd say log base three log base two of our input eight is equal to three. So we start off with eight. We can divide it once to get four, divide again for the second time to get two, and the third time to get one. All right, so you can see how this relates to binary search because at each step we're dividing the problem in half. And what we wanna know is if we're dividing the problem in half, how many times does that imply we have to do our comparison operator, since we do the comparison operator once each time we go through the loop with the um, half list? And it tells us that there will be log base 2 of n, where n is the size of the list, comparisons. All right, so now we can say that binary search is big O of log base 2 of n the log base two of n function grows much more slowly than the big O of n function. So already we can see that if the time, the work being done, the number of comparisons grows much more slowly for binary search than for linear search, binary search is gonna be a faster algorithm than linear search. For example, if n is equal to a million, then binary search performs log two to the million operations. Um, which since the property of logs, we can bring the six down in front and then log two of 10 is just about three and a third. So we have th uh, six times three and a third, which is about 20 comparisons. Linear search on the other hand, that's where we had the for loop, looks at every element, has to do n comparisons in the worst case. In fact, in every case for, um, well, in the worst case for um, it's n and in, in the average case it's n over two. 
So we're going to, in the worst case, look at a million comparisons. That's a huge difference. Um, and the disparity in, in running time just gets bigger and bigger as we um, increase problem size. So if we're looking at a, a list of a billion items, uh, binary search is going to solve it that much faster than um, linear search. All right, so now we have a way of thinking about how to compare algorithms with this fairly simple mathematical formulations. So obviously binary search, as I said, is much faster than linear search. But there's one big assumption that we made when we did binary search, and that is we assumed that the list we were searching was sorted. It's only because the list is sorted that we get to divide the problem in half and then decide to search either the lower half or the upper half. If it wasn't sorted, we wouldn't, wouldn't know which way to go when we do that check to see whether um, the element, the midpoint that we're at, is less than or greater than the, um, the item we're looking for. So sorting is important, if nothing else, to provide um, a way for binary search to operate very quickly on a list. But in general, it tends to be that when we find a very fast algorithm, it's because we made some assumptions. We have to restrict the kinds of problems it can solve, and that'll often give us a, um, an increase in speed. And we'll see that again when we look at sorting algorithms here. There are many ways to sort a list. Um, here's just a few. Uh, selection sort, insertion sort, merge sort, bubble sort. We're going to take a look at bubble sort and see how fast that operates. Bubble sort is a really simple search algorithm. Uh, in your Zybooks reading, you will also look at quick sort and merge sort. They're somewhat more um, difficult to analyze. They take advantage of dividing the problem in two, just like binary search did, and they get a speed up uh, doing that. And we'll see what that speed up gives us in a minute here. But let's focus on bubble sort. So here's an array. Uh, notice this array is not sorted. We're going to rearrange the items in this list so that no element to, to the left is to the left of a smaller element. That's what we're going to try and have our algorithm do. And I'm going to claim that if we do that, we end up with a sorted list every time. So we're just going to run through the list and make this property that whenever we see an element to the left of wherever we of, of its neighbor, um, and that element is greater than its neighbor, we're going to swap them. All right. So for example, here we have a thousand, a thousand is less than two. When we come across this pair, we're going to reorder them, put the two where the thousand was and the thousand where the two was. And in that way, we're going to repeatedly um, fix up this property so that the smaller items are always to the left. And eventually all the smaller items will be to the left of the larger items. All right. So let's go through this. Um, we're going to imagine a program that compares list sub zero, so the um, position at zero, which is seven, and at one, which is 99. We're going to check to see if seven is less than, is greater than 99. It's not. So we move on to the next step. We're going to check is 99 greater than 1,000. It's not, so we move on. Is 1,000 greater than 2? Yes. So immediately our algorithm has said, okay, these are out of order. Right? Minus 7 is less than 99, so that's not out of order. 99 is less than 1,000, so that's not out of, out of order. But 1,000 being less than 2 is out of order. All right, that's true. And now we perform a swap. So we're going to swap 2 and 1,000 and move on. So notice that after we do that swap, it's still not the case that everything beforehand is sorted. It's only that the pairs are all being sorted up to where we were. Right? So minus 7 is less than 99, 2 is less than 1,000. But not the case that 99, of course, is less than 2. All right, we check again. Is 1,000 greater than 3? Yes, it is. So we're going to swap those. And you see how we're moving 1,000 through the list at each step? And that's why it's called bubble sort, because the larger value we found, 1,000, bubbles up through the list to um, the top. All right. So we've been through the whole list once. That took n operations. And now we have bubbled up our largest value all the way to the top. 
We repeat this again, we start at zero, and we look for the next largest item, and we bubble up 99. But let's take a look in detail what's happening when we bubble up to. So first we check whether minus seven was greater than two, which it's not, so we move on. Is two greater than minus five? Yes, it is. So now we're gonna start bubbling up two. It ends up in a position, and now we fully sorted the list, right? That was the last iteration we had to do to have all the items um, in the right order. Our algorithm doesn't know that, so it keeps on searching, just checking over and over until it gets to the end of the list. So here's how we would implement that in Python. Um, the first thing I want to do is implement swap. Uh, swap is a really simple function here. It just takes a list and it's going to swap the element that's at position one for the element in position two. Um, I have to keep a temp variable here so I don't overwrite the, um, the element that I'm swapping uh, on the way. So I set the position one element to be temp, then set position one to be position two, and then position two to be equal to temp. Now, Python has some nice ways to avoid having to write a swap function like this, but that's really a quirk of Python. It, it gives that to you for free. Um, this approach would work for any programming language. All right. Next, we need to iterate through the list, um, checking at every step whether the element at position j is greater than the element at position j plus one, right? That's just exactly what we're doing here. We're just checking the neighboring elements to see if they're out of order. And if they are out of order, we swap them. Now we have to add an outer loop that's going to go through this and do it over and over and over again. In fact, we're going to do it as many times as there are elements in the list. And the reason for that is that when we find an element, we bubble it up to the top but we may need to bubble up every single element. So if all the elements in the list were out of order, if it was sorted in reverse order, for example, we would have to bubble up every single one of those and, and move them out of place. So we have to check over and over and over again to make sure that we've moved the next greatest item all the way to the right position. All right. Uh, so here's a full program with our, our swap function, um, indentations not quite right here, and a practice list. So we're just going to test to see if this really works. So here's the input list, 267.93797. Notice I can have repeats in my list, that doesn't break anything. And then here's the sorted list, and yes, it, it is correctly sorted. So I believe that um, our implementation of bubble sort here does work. All right, so as with search, it's the comparison here that governs how many steps it takes to solve the problem. Now with search, it was the equality comparison that mattered. The only comparison we're gonna do for sorting is this greater than comparison. So that's what we're gonna keep track of. So remember that we um, have this loop that goes all the way through all the elements in the list. So we're gonna do at least n comparisons here. And then we have an inner loop that is also going to go through all the elements of the list each time performing this comparison. And so the work done is going to be n uh, comparisons for every, every time we go through this outer loop. And we go through the outer loop n times. So now we have a total number of comparisons that's n times n, which is equal to n squared. So now we can say the worst case analysis is the bubble sort performs n squared comparisons. So it runs in n squared time. Now you might notice that bubble sort is not a very smart algorithm. In fact, its average case and its worst case are always the same. It always goes through the list n squared times no matter what. Even if the list was already sorted and there was no work really to be done, it would still go through the list n squared times. It's just not smart enough to realize that the list is already sorted. All it looks at is the pairs. 
and swaps pairs if they're out of order. All right. So we're going through um, this list where each bar, the height of each bar, represents the value. So the larger bars are bigger numbers and the smaller bars are smaller numbers. And we're going through at each loop and swapping pairs until we end up with a fully sorted list. So we saw that bubble sort is n squared. Um, are there faster sorting algorithms? And the answer is yes. Um, in fact, it turns out that we can do much better. And we'll look at that in a second. We can ask other questions like, does the ordering of the values in the list we are sorting matter? So does it matter if the list is already sorted? Do we have an algorithm that will figure that out and run faster? Um, does it matter if the algorithm is perfectly uh, sorted in reverse order? Does that affect how fast our algorithm runs? That is, does the particular input matter? For bubble sort, we sort doesn't matter. It just goes through n squared times no matter what. But there are some algorithms where they'll run faster or slower depending on what the input is. All right, so the next um, video here, we're going to look at a lot of different sorting algorithms at once. And we're going to look at them with different inputs. So we're going to start off by looking at random inputs. That means the there's no particular ordering to where the large values are and the and the small values in the input list. All right, so we've got several algorithm hidden here. <clears throat> Here's our bubble sort. We're working hard to um, put everything in order. But you can see that several algorithms are already finished. Merge sorts finished, quick sorts finished, shell sorts finished. While bubble sort is still going through doing those pair swaps. And you can see there's some other algorithms, for example, selection sort here and insertion sort that are also still working hard. And it turns out the selection sort, insertion sort, and bubble sort are also um, n squared algorithms. I want to move on from this, but I also want to emphasize that just how much slower bubble sort is than um, merge sort. In fact, let's do that one more time. I'm going to repeat this. You can you may have missed um, merge sort finishing. All right. So here's merge sort. See, quick sort's already done, and now merge sort. All right, so let's see what happens if we have different kinds of inputs. All right, so in this case, we're going to look at inputs where we only have a few unique values. Um, rather than having a lot of different values that we're sorting, we're only going to have uh, a few of those. And you can see how that's represented in um, just there being a few different uh, size bars here. Quick sort's already done. Bubble sort is slowly making progress. Merge sort's done. And shell sort's done. All right, let's see what happens if um, the list we're trying to sort is already in reverse order. And again, quick sort bubble and um, merge sort. And in this case, comb sort did well on this input. All right, so you saw visually how some sorting algorithms are much faster than others, but how can we talk about this in terms of uh, bigger notation? It turns out that merge sort and quick sort both do something similar to binary search. So they do have to go through the list um, at least once, but they're able to divide the problem, um, divide and conquer, just like binary search did. And so they're able to add, instead of another n term, so it'd be n squared, they have n times a log term. So the total big O running time for those algorithms is n log n. Um, and n log n is quite a bit faster than um, n squared. So merge sort is order n log n, big O of n log n. Quick sort is effectively um, n log n, 
If you read about it online, um, you'll see the worst case is actually n squared. But quicksort has been uh, fixed up in the last few years, so that's very, very unlikely. And so it really runs n log n. What's nice about quicksort, and you may have noticed this in the videos, is that on average it runs much faster than merge sort. So it has the same worst case in most most situations as merge sort, but on average it runs much faster. Shell sort, that you may have noticed, was also um, one of the first algorithms to complete in that video, uh, is not n log n, but it's slightly lo larger than n log n, but only marginally so. It sort of depends on the input it gets. All right. So there's another algorithm, sorting algorithm, called radix sort that actually can be much faster than n log n. One of the assumptions that we had um, when we were looking at our analysis of sorting algorithms before was that we can sort values of any size. We don't put a limit on how big the values can be that we're going to sort. And it turns out that slows us down. If we can put a limit on the largest value uh, in the list, then we can do radix sort that basically looks at each bit in the binary representation of um, that number and is able to sort not an n log n time, but n times d time. So d is the largest number we allow in the list. And so as the numbers get bigger and bigger, the runtime, the worst case runtime gets um, slower and slower. But if we have relatively low numbers, uh, radix sort can be very, very fast. So here's radix sort. Uh, you can see it iterating through um, a randomly uh, allocated list of numbers. And it very quickly is able to sort all of these into the right order. All right. All right, so let's plot the uh, growth rate of these different big O functions um, all together. So remember that log n is how um, how much the algorithm is slowed down as the list size increases. So on the y-axis here, I have the problem size. And on the y-axis, I have the number of comparisons being performed, which is our measure of how much work is being done or how slowly the algorithm can solve the problem. All right. And you can see that with log n, which is our binary search, it barely even registers as above the x-axis um, as problem size increases. Remember that for a problem size of a million, log n was only about 19 or 20. Then we have n. This was our linear search. It's significantly um, higher here than log n, but it's only growing in a straight line over time. Here's n log n, which again is almost a straight line. It's growing as n, but we're going to multiply it by this log term. And that log term starts to add up when you're multiplying it against n. So this is as fast as we know how to solve um, the general sorting problem. Um, if, if we don't restrict the size of the values we're sorting, this is as fast as we know how to do it. All right, and then you can see here, the growth rate is really um, speeding up. Speeding up here meaning that it's slowing down the algorithm as the um, problem size increases. So the growth and how long it takes is getting uh, faster and faster. So here's n squared. n squared is our bubble sort algorithm. And now you can see why it took so long in those videos for bubble sort to do the same, to solve the same problem as an n log n uh, program. And then finally, we have the exponentials. So exponential problems um, are often sort of a computer scientist's worst nightmare. There are lots and lots of exponential problems. For example, I talked about the traveling salesperson problem in our um, functional programming lecture, and that's an exponentially growing problem. Um, so problems like this, if they get very large, can exceed um, you know, the expected running time of an algorithm to solve them can exceed the lifetime of the universe so far. You get really huge numbers very, very fast with these exponentials. Remember that log was the inverse of exponential. So as slowly as log is growing, which is great, as f that's as fast as the exponentials are growing, which is not so great. One of the 
in fact, the biggest open question in computer science, in theoretical computer science, is whether all the algorithms we know of, like the traveling salesperson algorithm, that we only know how to solve in exponential time, so they're in a lot of ways impossible for us to solve if they're very large, whether that's really the best we can do. Uh, the problem is called um, whether p is equal to np, uh, whether polynomial time algorithms um, are equal to um, non-deterministically checked polynomial problems. Uh, but the, the take-home message is that if we can find a way of solving often even one of these exponential problems, we'd be able to solve almost all of them. And if that's the case, there are all kinds of currently insolvable things that we'd be able to solve very fast. All right. All right, so we've seen in this lecture um, several algorithms for sorting data, um, for searching uh, lists, and we've learned how to think about their relative speeds. And this is what computer scientists spend a lot of time on, is trying to find algorithms that we can prove uh, have big O functions that bound their worst case that's less than some existing algorithm. Because if we can do that, we can solve those problems faster and solve bigger problems. So the next lecture, we're going to look at data structures. And data structures are a way for us to build um, systems that we can run algorithms on more quickly. So right now, we've been looking at lists, where we have to iterate through the list. It's just an order. There are other data structures we can create that allow us to write even faster um, algorithms for performing operations like getting the biggest element or sorting the, the the yeah, um, data structure. All right, so as I said before, I used several animations from Timo Bingman. Um, his YouTube channel has uh, those same videos with sounds. You can listen to the algorithms as watch them. And he's even posted the, sort, the, uh, the code he wrote to generate those, um, those videos in GitHub. It's written in Java. And just a reminder from the last interactive lecture where we visited GitHub and looked at the Python source code that Guido and others have written. And we noticed that was mostly written in C, and we took a look at how some of that code is written. So that's here as well. All right, I'm going to stop there. Um, stay well and healthy, and I'll see you in the interactive lectures, um, and you'll see me in my recorded lectures. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.